Right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I really did not expect to see a full room, given that the elevator has broken down. So thank you all for climbing the stairs and try not to breathe so much so that we can have some air in here. Now, you might think I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong. I'm not. I'm going to tell you where we have gone wrong, like mistakes that we've made in the past uh, so that we can all learn from them so that you can make different mistakes and come here uh, and tell us about them. Uh, I will say, you know, do this and don't do that. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm, this is a short formulation for these are the th conclusions that I have come to so that you can perhaps come to different conclusions or speed up the, the, your path of learning. And in everything, whether it's data engineering, whether it's playing the piano, you know, if you don't know any rules or guidelines, it will sound terrible. Once you get some things in place, you can provide value play uh, as time goes by, uh, but in order to like, do something really good, you have to bend the rules. So I'm trying to convey the sort of rules and practices that I have come to conclude. You might come to different conclusions. Uh, why am I standing here? Why, why am I suitable to do this? Well, I've, had the, uh, I've been very lucky in my career in a couple of aspects. I worked for some co very good companies that are really good at these things and picked a few things up from, from very talented people. Uh, in the last two and a half years, I've been an independent consultant, uh, and I've been helping a whole bunch of companies. So I've seen more like big data environments than, than most people, and in that many environments, there are some patterns emerging, things that people do over and over again, and that's what I'm trying to convey to you. Uh, so how do I find a mistake? Well, a mistake is something that prevents you from reaching your end goals. And there are actually different end goals out there. My def definition of an end goal is, is like some kind of profit, like either money or happy users or something of business value. Uh, that there are other goals out there, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously. And that's fine, but that's, that's uh, my definition for the sake of this talk. And we do notice that people make a lot of mistakes. This is a Gartner quote that, that uh, maybe 60% failed mistakes was, was an underestimation. I think it's like, uh, oh, sorry, 60% failed big data projects was an underestimation. Maybe it's like more like 85%. And I've seen some, some companies fail, and I've seen some companies succeed. So I'm trying to convey the, what I see as a difference. This is a general blueprint. Uh, this, since this is a data tech conference, I assume most of you are familiar with it. You have services doing things on one end. You, they emit events that you collect, or they have stored data in databases, and you collect that data, put it into some kind of, of cold store, raw zone, where you sort of keep it forever, if it wasn't for GDPR. Uh, and then from there, you build like uh, processing pipelines, uh, Spark, Hadoop, whatever your favorite thing is. And at the end, there's an egress stage where you take things out of your data lake and, and um, push it to, to make, this, make it useful in the end. Uh, this is, picture is focused on batch. There's a stream equivalent. I'll come to that later in the talk. So <clears throat> as you start out, and this is the way that people started out uh, years ago, and some, some, and, but it still happens, is that you, you, you write a little batch script or something. And you take the data that you've collected for a particular hour and you run Spark on it, because Spark is, is a decent tool. Uh, and then you want to uh, do something on a daily basis. In this example, you want to ca count some perform key performance indexes. You want to form sessions because if you want pro product insights into your, uh, into your web shop or something. So uh, works fine for a while. Um, then you add your campaign uh, manager decides that you want some more information, so you add some job to the right that is dependent on the stuff to the left in order to, ca to calculate the impact of your campaigns. Also works fine for a little while, uh, but then something goes wrong on the left, and the dependent job on the right breaks. Not too bad. You can, you can go in, you can rerun it manually, but you start to realize that this doesn't scale beyond a few jobs. It's even worse with other types of failures that might very well lead to silent data corruption. So much later, you will discover that you didn't have all the data and you were doing the wrong calculations. Uh, this goes out of hand very quickly. Uh, and the uh, solution to this is something that manages your dependencies. That's called the workflow orchestrator. Um, now, there are a bunch of them out there. And if you only remember one thing from this talk, 
That is, pick up a good workflow orchestrator. Uh, that is the, one of the keys to success. Uh, unfortunately, there are, there are some, some that are uh, weak out there, weak in the sense that you cannot express all the things that you need. And you recognize them because they are using uh, non-expressive languages as the DSLs, such as XML or, or graphical interfaces. Unfortunately, uh, many of the vendors ship the weak ones rather than the good ones. Uh, Google is the shining exception. They recently for, uh, announced the managed airflow service. Airflow is one of the two good ones. Uh, and the other one is called Luigi. Both of these are perfectly fine tools. Um, if you're not using them, have a look at them. Uh, I tend to recommend Luigi to my clients. I'm a little bit biased. I used to work at Spotify where we made Luigi. Uh, but it's much simpler. It's, it's easy to get started with. It has a smaller scope. I like simple tools. They do one thing well. And that, that leads to simpler operations and so forth. But Airflow has some, some advantages as well, so it's a trade-off. All right, uh, off to number two. Um, Hadoop can do a whole lot of things. It can look as a SQL database. And it can even do transactions these days. So that's great. We don't need a, a, a SQL database anymore. We can ditch our own old Oracle database or what we want and just use Hadoop. And uh, we have really powerful tools that we can use queries all over the data lake to bring out the data that we want in real time when we need it uh, by querying a lot of data sets. That sounds great. Now, it's not so great, because that's not what these uh, big data technologies were meant for. Unlike the relational databases, they're distributed. And with distributed technologies, you sacrifice a whole lot of things in order to gain scalability and performance and redundancy. Now, what you sacrifice is the multipurpose. Distributed technologies are good at one thing, and typically one thing only, or maybe two or three. But with everything that you add, you are sacrificing. You, know, uh, you are sacrificing quality. Uh, so the Hadoop technologies and all the surrounding technologies were made for offline processing, not online processing. So if you're using them for online, just uh, do as you used to do and bring in new technologies. You're actually making things worse. And the, this sort of big data revolution that we're somewhere in the middle of, is actually not about new cool technologies or lots of data. Yes, there is some of that as well, but that's not where I see companies get the most value. Where they get the most value is from new ways of working and collaborating. You, instead of these peer-to-peer -peer organizations on the left, where you have to talk to five different teams in order to get your data to do something innovative with data, you pour down you have an organization that pours down all of the data and democratizes it internally in the organization, which means that you can do data innovation a lot faster, either in, in, for batch in the data lake or in stream storage for real-time processing. The other big benefit is working in, in pipelines, where you save the raw data rather than say, processing it first and then saving it, so that you can go back if things go wrong, and you can invent new things from the raw data. And this gives a tremendous iteration speed and it really powers data innovation if you get it right, if you are able to move quickly. So, save the data. In one company, we decided that uh, we wanted to do an important calculation. It was important that we got it right. So all of the nodes that were like saving data, collecting data, uh, we asked them to, uh, to sort of push all the data uh, into Hadoop, and we only started the calculations once all the data was in there. The problem is that all the data um, takes a while to figure out whether all the data is in there, and when those started failing, this took like longer and longer and longer and got more and more fragile. So the more we scale out, the worse the system got. And also, this was good for reporting, where we really needed the good quality. But if you just want to do dashboards or products inside, Quality is less important than getting the results quickly. So there is no good answer on how long you should wait. So another company said, OK, we're not going to wait. We're going to start processing. And uh, then we're going to monitor the late incoming data. And uh, when it, once it reaches 1%, 2% something, we recalculate downstream. Uh, now, this ha has different disadvantages, because the downstream 
calculations are no longer predictable and reproducible, which is okay for some cases, but not great if you want to do like uh, machine learning or data science experiments where you tweak your algorithm and say, did it get better? No, the data changed, so you don't really know. <coughs> on a tangential note, on a different company, uh, the people doing the event collection said, well, we have this service that do IP geo lookups. Wouldn't the, all the events be better if we like, decorated them with, with some geo information? So let's do that before we save the data. That was fine. We got even better events until the IP geo service broke down or did the wrong thing. And we now had some events with missing data or wrong data, and that, that is painful to recover from. Anecdote number four. We had some processing where we needed information in a database. So uh, Hadoop can, and Spark, they can go and look up things in databases uh, to decorate the data. So we just go to the production database and, and do that. Uh, now, if, that, if you're doing a large computation, that might take down the, the production database. But if we're doing a small uh, computation, that's fine, uh, until you need to rerun it, because then the production data has changed and your pipeline is no longer reproducible. What do these four stories have in common? They are deviating from functional principles. Now, if you've learned functional programming, you, you, you may, might have picked up principles of immutability. Once you've written something, never change it. Item potency, right? Uh, you should be able to repeat operations. And reproducibility, right? Everything should be deterministic. And whether we're doing functional programming or not doesn't matter, but this is this, these are the same principles applied on an architecture level. And following, the, following these principles makes your life a lot easier. So once you've written data sets, let me change them. And make sure that your, your execution is reproducible. Actually, there are a whole bunch of exceptions to this reproducibility. In some cases, it's worth sacrificing it for a good reason, but know when you are doing it and why you are doing it. So the, uh, the uh, solution to not going to, in order to avoid going to the databases from jobs in production, or production databases from, from Hadoop jobs, you can dump the databases on a daily basis. So for each day, like you have a copy of the database. That's great. Uh, Spark, or there are tools like Spark and Scoop that can go out to a database and, and dump it. So this is one of my favorite uh, war stories. We had a Cassandra cluster serving users. It was a big Cassandra cluster, like 40, 50 nodes, something. Lots of users. And uh, we wanted that information on a daily basis. And so we had a Hadoop cluster. And there's a lot of data. So we had like you know, 20, then 50, then 100 Hadoop machines going out to get all of that data. So that created quite a load spike on the, on the Cassandra cluster. Cassandra is very scalable, so it could sustain the spike. But the spike came, became half an hour long, and an hour, and two hours. And one day, the spike got 25 hours long, so we had a double spike in, in one hour. Uh, that took down the login service. The user people, uh, login service people were not happy, so they put a network firewall in between the Hadoop cluster and the Cassandra cluster. <laughs> Problem solved. Uh, and we had to f figure out a better way. So I wasn't paying attention. A couple of years later, somebody wanted to do the same thing, this also with the login service, and they decided not to go to the database, but go to the nice little REST interface where you, you got very clean data. And uh, of course, the same thing happened, like this, the, the, this cluster brought down the, the login service. So this, you, can, you can have Hadoop as, a, as a, like a denial of service attack. This can happen on the egress side as well. This is a recommendation scenario. Uh, the people doing the recommendations, they had this great new algorithm. So uh, they had computed big indexes for recommendations, and they wanted to push this out to test it to the users. So they dumped it all in the Cassandra cluster, and Cassandra was replicated. So Cass Cassandra happily replicated this to the other data centers, which took all of the cross-Atlantic bandwidth, uh, which was needed to more, much more important things, such as serving users, so forth. So what we learn, offline is, the offline environment is very powerful. It's an de internal denial of service attack, basically, ready to kill your online environments at any moment. So you want to separate these two environments, right? In the online, things are really important. If things break, you have unhappy users out there, and they give crappy feedback. They shout on Twitter and things like this. 
So we really need to, to like be proactive with making sure that these systems are up. The impact is high, so the probability needs to be low. In the offline world, you have internal people like, like doing business insights and so forth. Uh, there are a few of them, and they are quite good at uh, giving feedback because they come to your desk. So things might go wrong, right? You, you don't need to protect these things as well in the offline world. So you can take a much higher risk and do your sort of uh, quality assurance on a, a, a lazy basis. When things, when things go wrong, you go in there and you do more quality assurance. You have much higher return of investment on, on that type of quality assurance. So what I learned is to separate the online world from the offline world in the middle and also from the online world at the end and have very careful handovers in between. So for dumping databases, for example, you can take a nightly backup of your database, bring up an offline uh, database, uh, and dump from that one. That's not serving any users anymore. And likewise, uh, if you're pushing like, uh, recommendation machine learning models out there, uh, throttle it, and then keep a, a several versions of these recommendation models or fraud detection models so you can switch back to an old one. If the offline world fails you and you don't get new models uh, on a daily basis, you still have a few all to go to. So, <clears throat> Ali uh, is a, an old colleague of mine. And he, he decided to do an academic career you know, in the middle of the big data hype in like 2007, 8 or something. Uh, he decided to go to academia. Uh, and I said, oh, I will work at Google at the time. Like, Ali, come and work with us. We have, we're doing super fun things. No, 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 I'm going to go to academia. And then they built th this thing called Spark. And he ended up, by accident, he ended up being CEO of the coolest startup, one of the coolest startups ever. Um, and he says, like, we have clients with petabytes and petabytes of data, and they all want to do machine learning. Uh, and I'm sure they have those clients. In fact, there are companies that generate petabytes of data, even because they, they have like a billion users, or they have things like jet engines that produce a whole, approximately as much data as a billion users. Now, most companies don't have petabytes. They have like gigabytes because they have users that produce a few kilobytes per day and they are, the number of users is limited by the, you know, the number of Swedish speakers or something. Um, so you actually don't need scale. And your data might very well fit in memory. But if you go for clusters anyway, you, you are taking a very large cost because in distributed systems, lots and lots of things happen that never happen on a single machine environment. And you want to make sure that if you're going to clusters or scaling out, that you get value for paying all of, for all of these problems and costs. So uh, mistake number five is like uh, scaling for imaginary or, uh, or, or engineering for imaginary scaling problems. Right? Your data is likely to fit in memory on the largest cloud instances, or at least a portion of your data. Uh, remember the, the value of big data. It's not about, uh, about sizes and necessarily machine learning either, but about new ways of working and collaboration and, and innovating. In the most successful project I've been in, we're using Spark, but never in clusters. We're only using it in local mode. This is a, a, this is a company who has very little business outside of Sweden, so we know we can't get more than 10 million users or something. Everything fits in memory, only local mode. Works great. So a uh, client went, came to me and said, we have this issue that uh, things are going slow by the day. Are you sure storing things in S3 is a, is a, good, uh, uh, a good strategy here? And they pointed me to, to a blog post. And that made me f figure out what they were actually doing. This blog post, they have a job that l reads like one year of data uh, every day. Um, and uh, there was another situation where we were having uh, this large cluster, and there was this system that was using like a large portion of the cluster all the time, and we figured out they must be doing something really important. It turns out that they were de reading years and years of full raw data on a daily basis, hundreds of terabytes, computing something, and then dropping it all. So the next day, they would read hundreds of terabytes again. So usually, you don't need to do that. And it's better to change your algorithms so that they are incremental, so that you can process the new data 
and do as much as you want or as much as you can, typically aggregate on a daily basis. And then, even if you want results on a regular basis, results for more than, um, for a longer, larger time period, you do only the final part of the computation. So in this example, let's say you want to make a top list of the, uh, of the most uh, popular countries where, you, where, your, country, where your customers are, uh, or the countries that place the most orders. Um, and you want to do that on a daily basis or the rolling one-year window. If you do it the naive way, you would read all of the raw data, join with your user database, and uh, produce the top list every day. If you do it in an incremental way, you would each day count the number of users in each country, so you join with the user database, and you do the heavy computation day by day, and then only in the end to do form the top list, you, need to do, you, you take the aggregate. This is lots of data. This is a small amount of data. Is this comprehensible? OK, it's blended. So um, the data lake has, has like a, a real-time variant as well. It's called the unified log. Instead of putting it, all, all the things in, in batches and files in your lake, you put, you put it in a stream so that everybody can consume. This is a data tech conference. You are very familiar with it. Uh, you can do similar pipelines, like with stream processing that puts, spits out data to new streams and, and uh, do the same thing, but, but in real time instead of batch. And uh, surely. This must be much better. I mean, you, get, you don't have to wait till the next day to get the results. Uh, you, some things you think uh, need to be quick. And uh, it, in particular, the demos look much better, right? And uh, you've heard some, some cool companies say that this, this is the, what the cool guys are doing. Now, this comes with a cost. And this cost is called operations. If you change things in your streaming environment, uh, you need to be much more careful. So if you, if you change your schema, for example, you need to do it in a careful manner because if the, you're spinning out new data and your downstream uh, pipelines or downstream jobs get, co get confused by the new data, they will crash and then you will have an operational problem. If you do the same thing in batch, they will crash as well. But batch is very forgiving because there are things like the workflow orchestrator that will retry your failed jobs. So once you fixed it, you recover again. There are ways to deal with this. This is, scenario is more difficult. If you have a bug and you spit out invalid data, then your events will spread out through all of your pipelines, and some of them will be bad. And uh, in, instead of having you know, 10 batches of bad things, you have like 10 million events that are bad. So you have to f reach out and figure out which ones are the bad and try to discard them. So, this is a much more difficult scenario to recover from. And there are no tools to, to really help you here. If you compare this with batch and take the operational scenario where you have a faulty job up there and it produces some like, faulty recommendation indexes or something, what you do is you realize, oh no, the, the indexes are bad. Let's revert to the old ones because you've sav you're saving a few copies of the old ones, right? Um, then you fix your bug. And then you just remove the faulty data sets, which are like approximately 10 of them. And you can look in your workflow orchestrator because it keeps a dependency tree so you know which they are. You can build tooling for this, but it's, it's, uh, people haven't because it's fairly easy to do. And then you're done. Nothing more operationally to do, right? Uh, because the workflow orchestrator will see it. Oh, some data sets are missing and will refill them for me. At least if you use Luigi. With Airflow, it's a bit more complicated, but it's still not difficult. This means that you can recover from programming errors in like th about 30 minutes, even though they were in production. And this speed gives immense power to your data innovation. But you only get this in batch. This is a Confluence blog post on how to recover from a similar scenario in, in, with Kafka streams. It's a lot. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's actually a really good blog post. They describe very well. Uh, they do fantastic work. Uh, but it, only, it doesn't cover the pipeline scenario. It only, it only works for if you have a single job and not a full pipeline of jobs. So by all means, go for stream processing. But make sure that you pay a price in terms of operations. So make sure that you have a use case for it. Right? 
or that you perhaps you have a case where the data quality is not super important, so you are only feeding dashboards or, or something, that's fine. Right? Now the good news is that this gap is decreasing because the tooling is getting better. Confluent is doing a fantastic job on, on pushing this to the world, and so and I see some things coming out of Google as well. So hopefully, in, a, in a, like five years or something, I can't be standing here and saying this. All right. Um, some, sometimes you, the data looks wrong. You discover that after a while. I was in a team uh, where we really cared about the data quality, really cared about getting things right, and we were taking lots and lots of data from, from the rest of the company. And so the manager called us the sewer of the company, because everything that people were doing wrong or hazily upstream, like we had to deal with. Uh, at one point, we saw that, well, wait a minute, this content type is supposed to be like text or audio or video or something, and one day it was content type bullshit in some of the messages. It turned out somebody pushed like an experiment to production upstream, and they never noticed, but we, of course, noticed. So unless you are proactive with monitoring quality like this, you will find problems weeks, months, years later, and then they are much more expensive to deal with. And there are four quality dimensions to care about. Timeliness is producing results on time. That, that one's not so difficult, because if you don't produce things on time, people will explain. Correctness is about uh, doing, getting the computations right. Testing can help you here. So that one's fairly straightforward. Completeness is more difficult. It's about making sure that all of the data that you wanted to compute on, all of the things that happened during the month, are actually in this month's data. Likewise, consistency. If you, if you have two data sets that are supposed to contain the same things, like two reports pointing to the same thing, uh, do they really have the same uh, input data? And the latter two you need to monitor for. There are no, no tools or things that, out there that can help you. So the mistake is uh, writing your pipelines and then be happy. You need to monitor the contents. And you have a good... One good tool is called counters or aggregators or accumulators. So whenever you code and you see, well, this item here, it's supposed to match a user in the database. What if it doesn't? Ask yourself, right? And if it doesn't, bump a counter. Don't do anything smart. Just bump a counter so that you can monitor whether things match your expectations or not. That's how we found out about the content type bullshit uh, incident. Uh, you need to go a bit further than that uh, and actually measure consistency between the data sets and between the records in the data sets and so forth. Likewise here, there are no tools uh, to help you as well. And the counters is one reason that, where I where, uh, it's one reason that I'd recommend people to stay off of SQL processing for, for really important pipelines, because SQL makes you forget about these things. There are no natural places to put in these counters or compensate for that. All right, things break, and sometimes you do something wrong, sometimes somebody else has done something and didn't inform you, so, so things break. The effect here is that you become reluctant, and you become careful, and, oh, I'm not sure I want to change this, because it might break something downstream. Um, and we had a situation where we, uh, where we were built, the old pipeline was no good, so we built a new pipeline. And that was really quick. It's, you can move things, uh, you can innovate quickly. Unfortunately, re changing and removing old things takes a lot of time. So we had the old one running for like 18 months or so. And that, uh, that old one was a lot of burden to us. So the problem is that these changes that you want to make are often in different teams. So you're, you're, it's difficult to go across the team boundaries. Right? So what you, ha what you end up with is an inability to move quickly. We measured this in one company, and we, we concluded that if we, if we collect a new field at the client, the average time for this to be used at the end was like one month. And this is a, this is a good company, uh, like very agile, uh, independent teams, and so forth. Right? Uh, I've also seen te teams where you don't have the communication channels, and then there's no... Uh, there is no upper limit to how, how long time it takes to, to uh, propagate new data from upstream. I've also seen environments where this is technically tightly coordinated, and then you can move on the order of days. 
this significantly impacts your able to, to innovate at a different at, at a high speed. The remedy, the only remedy I'm aware of, is to do testing end to end. So that you have a safe testing environment, so you know when you break things, then you can move fast. But this is often against the company culture. If you have autonomous teams, the, this can be difficult to do. All right, uh, you've heard about the functional principles, like you do immutability, and uh, you, in order to be reproducible, you dump all of the user databases everywhere, so you have thousands of copies of the user database and so forth. And this is all great until somebody knocks on your shoulder and says, uh, what about privacy? What about erasing users? Uh, okay, wait a minute. And uh, the most expensive engineering mistake that I've seen was most made in this area. Uh, it turns out that it takes a lot of effort to wash petabytes of data. So you don't want to be in a situation where you haven't planned for this. Likewise, if you allow your teams to do like to choose arbitrarily anything. You have autonomous teams, uh, and, and they, are, they are supposed to be uh, able to deploy really quickly without coordinate, coordinating with, with, with lots of people. You end up in a situation where you have variance in things that don't really matter, such as time format. I think I, I counted to somewhere around 25 different formats in, in one day, data lake. And some of them were really crazy, but we couldn't change that because we were lacking the end-to-end -end testing. And also, I had this situation where the, um, I was writing a pipeline, and uh, I was trying to use Beam. And uh, I was happily writing along. And when the job was done, it turned out that the input data was actually parquet. And I never looked, because it was like Avro everywhere. So yeah, I guess I could have looked. But this is something, this needless variance is something that adds friction to your, to your innovation speed. So what you knew, need to do. There are some things that you need uh, that you are better off planning early. And I'm sorry for throwing like an enterprise uh, buzzword at you here. Uh, my definition of governance is the things that you should have done proactively so that would have prevented you from, from a painful situation later. And you can put anything in there as you want. And there are a couple of types of painful situations that you can be in. The ones to the right are like risk situations. You found that you are not compliant, or you have insufficient security, or whatever. So that's a, that's a way of risk mitigation. The ones to the left are all about your, your innovation speed, your ability to, to uh, innovate with data quickly. We've been through the development speed quite a bit. I want to point out this one. Uh, I've seen a whole bunch of teams that say, oh, Data is valuable. That's great. I have a lot of data. It's my data. And they don't want to share that. They don't want to put it in the lake or in the stream. Or whatever. Now, it turns out that a bit of governance uh, can loosen that up. So if you say, well, you're not, not actually putting it in the lake, and then everybody can do anything on it. There are rules here in the lake. And one of these rules can be they need to go and talk to you before they use your data, right? so, so that you limit the degrees of freedom in order to make people want to share and feel comfortable about sharing, right? So rules and degrees of freedom can, in, can increase your speed. So if we look back, there are a couple of themes here. Uh, one is, up in the right corner, is to sort of gravitate towards complexity more than protecting business value and working towards business value. The other one is, is to sort of gravitate towards uh, interesting technology or new technology more than the sort of the principles of, of, of big data and the principles of pipeline and data sharing, data democracy, and so forth. And uh, I find myself saying to clients over and over again a whole no number of things, like keep things simple, scope down as much as you can, Focus on the value. What's the value of this pipeline that we're building or this technology that we're building? And you can have hyper profit for each action that you take, but you can have both. The, these, the efforts that you go for, if you go for the hype things and if you go for the profit things are completely different. You might notice that none of the things that I say have anything to do with technology. So here are some... Uh, Links. The upper three ones are similar talks, uh, but less technical. 
more about you know, building teams and organizations and so forth. Uh, if you found some of the things that I said here confusing or you want to more know about the context, I suggest you go for the reading list. And uh, the last one is some of my old presentations from, from other conferences. Questions? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, anybody has a question? So I, I have one question. What do you think, from your experience, what are the 10 uh, mistakes was the most um, biggest problem in your experience? Well, um, I think that the picking up the new patterns, the, the, you know, the pipelines and, and the collaboration, is where you have the most profit, if you come from a, like a legacy environment. Uh, so, and that, I think that's one of the reasons why I see, where we see so many enterprise projects fail, right? They're, they're just bringing in new technology and then, and then they're just making things worse. Um, likewise, the, this one is, uh, the workflow orchestrator is, yes, it's new technology, but it's super simple and it really saves your sanity, right? That, and it makes you think in terms of pipelines and in terms of de delivering value. Um, the end-to-end -end agility, that's a mistake everybody makes. Like, I, I've seen, I only see few companies actually be good at this. And they are very coordinated, they have, they have a very specific company culture. Uh, so, uh, so you, and you can thrive without it, right? Which one is more costly? Uh, Which mistake is more costly? That depends on your environment, right? If, if you're in an enterprise environment, uh, this one is bound to be costly because you will set out to do a big project. You, I've seen a bunch of like, data lake projects and then go on for years without, uh, and then, then they start producing value once they've sort of picked important things up. So you can spend a lot of money there, but if you're a startup, that's not where you start, right? So it depends on your context. Steve. Great talk, Lars. Purely hypothetically, <laughs> Imagine you've got multiple data sources, one of them is using one of those random time sources and they're an hour out, so your data's coming out wrong. How would you go about debugging that? Sorry, I didn't understand the How context. would you go about debugging, say, one of your data sources is slightly dirty, so your answers are coming in there out. How do you, you know, begin to, to go backwards from bad results to? From bad results to, to bad incoming data. Yeah, uh, yeah I've done that uh, on a number of occasions since I was in the team where we cared about the results. Um, the, there are no shortcuts. Uh, so once you end up uh, with the bad results, uh, you just have to debug step by step. But from there, you can improve, right? So, so this was in a... In an, company where we had a strong tradition of learning from mistakes and doing postmortems and so forth. And in those, I mean, these kinds of issues were always postmortems because they, they, we cared about that, that particular, those particular data sets. Uh, so we would do, you know, five whys and see what went wrong, what did go wrong, how can we prevent this from going wrong in the future. And we would include all of the teams affected all the way out to the, to the data collection and the client, right, and see. So you must improve here in order for us to get the, get the reports right. Uh, and then we all, this also was in the company where we had a, a very transparent uh, culture. So the results of the postmortems were shown to everybody. Uh, in order to have that kind of culture, you must have a culture of no fear. So you must be, uh, allow yourself to be vulnerable and nobody must ever, never ever get punished for doing something wrong and being open about it. Unfortunately, changing culture takes a long time. Any more questions? Yeah, Lars, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you thank for you. your presentation.